Hey guys, Johan here from Strauss & Co. Levercraft. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. We are going to take this Gilbert rugby ball and we're going to cut it up and see what is inside. Um, I've never actually seen what's inside a rugby ball. It's quite heavy, so I imagine there's a fabric lining and everything. Um, and what I just said was a complete lie because I already made one. I made a custom, handmade, hand-stitched rugby ball. Uh, so this making of will be right after I cut this up and see what's inside. So yeah, and while that happens, while I'm making this whole thing, I'm going to give you a little bit of a history of the, the Gilbert brand itself. Um, you know, we all grew up with Gilbert, but we don't necessarily know where they come from or where they started. So I'm going to do that, and I hope you enjoy the voiceover style content. I really enjoy making this content, so I will see you at the end of the video where there might be a little bit of a surprise. See you soon. I think to tell the story of where Gilbert got their start, we need to go back to a small town 133 kilometers north of London in Warwickshire called Rugby, at the aptly named Rugby School, where, as told by Matthew Bloxham, a former pupil at Rugby School, a rebellious team named William Webb Ellis played a game of football. In 1883 or 84, depending on whose story you believe, Ellis was being a little bit mischievous and caught the ball as someone kicked it to him and started running with it. Much to the dismay of his peers at the time because, you know, soccer rules I guess. But unknowingly, this was the action that set in motion the controversy around the rules of the game as we know it today. This story has been debated in the rugby world since 1895, since there is no conclusive evidence of this happening, but today it's widely believed to be the origin of rugby. However, the first set of rules for the game was written in August of 1845 by William Delafield Arnold, W. W. Shirley and Frederick Hitchens at the rugby school and named rugby football at the time. Now that we know where the game started, let's talk about why we are here. The balls. In 1823, William Gilbert was a cobbler or shoe repairman for those who don't know what a cobbler is. I didn't until about two years ago. It just so happens that he had a shop right next to the rugby school as mentioned previously. On the side, he made balls for the school and originally hand-stitched four panels of leather shells and inside were pig's bladders. This shape was much more different than we know rugby balls today. They were much bigger and rounder, which made them much easier to kick and play football with. Over time, the shape of the ball changed up until the advent of the rugby union in 1871, which saw the skyrocket in sales of balls for their company. In the early days, the balls were much more plum shaped. This was because of the pig's blood inside. The balls were inflated by mouth with a small stem made of clay. James Gilbert, the nephew of William Gilbert, who ran the Gilbert company alongside his uncle, was widely known for his unusual talent of inflating the pig bladders to such a degree that they would often burst. This job was not a clean one as they were very pungent and a really gross green color. I wish I could show you a picture but I might get de demonetized, it's really disgusting. By the time of William's passing in 1877, the Gilbert brand was producing nearly 2,800 balls a year and also started exporting balls to Australia, which was a huge boost in revenue. So James inherited his uncle William's company after his passing, running it successfully up until his passing in 1906 at the age of 75. He was known as a town hero, often giving balls to schoolboys for free and even fixing their boots without even asking for anything in return. Now bear with me because here's where the names get a little bit tricky. After James Gilbert passed in 1906, the company was then left to his son, John James Gilbert. He was skilled enough in the game of rugby football 
and played for the local rugby team, unlike his father, the crafter. This practical experience with the game gave him much valuable insights on how to improve the balls they produced at the time. He also introduced the use of Indian rubber inner bladders instead of the smelly pig's bladders due to their much safer and hygienic nature. He was however not the first man to do this as another ball maker and cobbler at the time in the same town of Warwickshire by the name of Richard Linden started using the Indian rubber bladders in his balls around 1862. It is also important to note that a lot of people accredit Richard with the invention of the oval shape of the modern rugby ball, but since he never patented or trademarked the invention, there's no way to prove this, or none that I can find anyway. He used a brass hand pump to inflate these balls. Unfortunately, this innovation would come too late as his wife sadly passed. Many believe her lung disease was caused by years of blowing pig's bladders. Very disgusting thought very sad about that on that very sad note back to james john sadly he also fell ill in 1914 during world war one and passed in 1917 leaving the gilbert company to his son i'll give you a second to guess his name his name was james at the time of his father's unli- untimely passing james was serving his country in france during the war But after returning, he and his mother took over the business and they strictly adhered to the legacy left by those that came before him. Quality, attention to detail and superior craftsmanship. But it wasn't all smooth sailing for the last of the Gilberts. There was a point where James was very troubled by the way he was moving forward. He questioned a lot of his decisions. Hey guys, I just quickly wanted to interrupt this video to say thank you to the sponsor of this episode woodsman wares guys if you're not familiar with woodsman wares they sell all kinds of man gear like really really cool gear so if you're looking for gifts for your husband your uh, brother your boyfriend your scallopy or whatever i'll put a little graphic here showing all of the products that they currently sell it's very very cool stuff so if you're looking for a gift or just want to spoil yourself man just Get something cool, spoil yourself, because you deserve it. Once again, thank you to Woodsman Wares for sponsoring this video. It really does mean the most, and let's get back to the video. The business fell in hard times because of James's inner battle. This was before he found a note that was written by the founder of Gilbert, William, that explained that Gilbert rugby balls were classified as educational tools. This was a bit of a profound moment for the troubled James because he finally realized that the sport of rugby was a tool for learning discipline and character. After this revelation, James put calls to the fire and continued his family's legacy. In 1927, Gilbert released a catalog to celebrate 100 years of being the leaders in the rugby ball world. They exported all over the world to countries like New Zealand, Japan, Australia, and my home country, South Africa. By now, Gilbert was the biggest supplier of rugby balls in the world, with each country having its preference of shape and panel count. For example, here in South Africa, where I live, we preferred an 8-panel ball that offered better grip than the New Zealand and Australian favorite torpedo-shaped ball, much like American footballs of modern times. In UK, they really like the four and six panels. Smooth sailing for the Gilbert brand. Well, at least for now. Even forming a joint venture with the soccer ball brand Tomlinson in 1946, who was responsible for most of the Gilbert distribution and marketing until way into the 1970s. The story of the Gilbert family is one of hard times, dedication, attention to detail, superior craftsmanship, and a love for the sport and the people who play it. James Gilbert was the last of the Gilbert family to be involved with the Gilbert brand. During this time, Gilbert and many other companies were still using leather for the outside panels of their balls, but due to innovations in materials from other companies, the Gilbert company was in a bad financial spot, forcing them to sell the company in 1978. It went through major changes in ownership between the 1980s and the 90s, 
swapping three ownerships during this time, they were forced to embrace change and developed a synthetic version of their classic ball, now named the Barbarian Match Ball. They also started producing other rugby equipment like togs and clothing. So, so far, Gilbert has produced a special ball for every single Rugby World Cup since 1995 and continues to do this to this day. Finally, the company was acquired by Greys of Cambridge in 2002, solidifying the brand as we know it, innovating and producing the highest quality rugby gear money can buy. As a South African, rugby is deeply ingrained in our blood. It isn't just a sport, it's a passion, it's a legacy, it's a symbol of unity. I wasn't there for 1995, but I can only imagine feeling the unity our country felt. Hopefully we can pull it off again this year. We'll see how that statement ages in a few weeks. That's all from me today. I hope you enjoyed the brief history of such a prolific brand as Gilbert. Let me know what you guys would like for the next topic. Thank you for watching. God bless you, God bless South Africa, and God bless the sport that unites us all. Stick around for the outro. Well, guys, uh, I really hope you enjoyed me making this South African style rugby ball. And the surprise is, I'm going to actually give this away. So if you really like this, please leave a comment in the comment section telling me what South African rugby or rugby in general means to you and your family uh, if you have any cool stories any cool tidbits or anything i'll choose the best comment in the next week or so and then i'll send you this rugby ball this strass and Co rugby ball with the gilbert bladder inside so yeah i really hope you enjoyed the video please consider liking and subscribing if you enjoy this content and i'll see you next week God bless and goodbye.